book of the Bible, so we're going to start Ephesians. <laughs> if you look at, open your Bible then to Ephesians, we'll try to begin. I'll explain a little of the historical and geographical uh, end of it, loved ones. That's the uh, Italy, of course, and then uh, Greece comes down there, and then you're over and <coughs> down to Jerusalem, and that's Mediterranean. This is Africa, you know, and here's probably Rome uh, there, and there's uh, Ephesus is there. Ephesus and uh, uh, Antioch, about there. This is the Palestine here, and Jerusalem is down here. About uh, about fifty uh, four A.D., Paul started his third missionary journey, and uh, I believe he went uh, like that, and then up round there and back, and uh, back to Antioch. And uh, he arrived in Ephesus. The journey went on to about 58 AD, and he arrived in Ephesus and spent from 54 to 57 in Ephesus. So probably longer than he had spent in any other church. He established a church there, and was there roughly two years. And then, you remember, he was arrested and taken to Rome. And in 62 AD, uh, he wrote three letters. And one of them was the letter to the Ephesians. So that's the, a little of the background. And as we go through Ephesians over the next 10 years or 12, as many years as it takes us. We'll talk more about the background of the church, but that is, uh, those are the historical issues anyway. That it was during his third missionary journey, he did three missionary journeys, you remember, and it was during his third one that he traveled to Ephesus, spent two years there in a church, went on round and then came back, and then was arrested, you remember, and taken to Rome probably about 60 A.D., and was allowed there to remain in fairly safe house arrest. And it was during that time, of course, that he wrote many of his letters, and one of them he wrote to the Ephesians. Uh, the church at Ephesus was quite mature, and therefore there were not a lot of problems in it. You remember in the letter to the Corinthians, he had to deal with the man who was living with his father's wife and all that kind of thing. And they had problems over communion and uh, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. And so he was dealing with specific issues there. But in Ephesians, he, he isn't. The church at Ephesus has not a whole lot of problems. And so I think that it's Old Luther described the letter to the Romans as the purest expression of the gospel that you could find, the purest and plainest, and that's one of the reasons I attempted to expand it over those years. But I think Lloyd-Jones is right in saying that if Romans is the purest and the plainest exposition of the gospel, then Ephesians is the sublimest and the most majestic. No, it is a wonderful book. And it's only when you begin to see the complexity of the whole Greek sentences that you realize how full of eloquence it is. And you begin to see this is not an ordinary exposition of the gospel at all. And uh, you could, in fact, say there are many characteristics that it has, but one of them certainly is that it's reality described from the standpoint of God. It's reality described from the standpoint of God. It's describing reality from actually the heavenly places. And so it is actually more real than most of what we are concerned with. Uh, we're concerned with, what can the Lord do for me? What has the Lord saved me from? 
how is the Lord going to help me in this situation? Uh, I remember uh, the gentleman, you remember, who is from Belfast, who, uh, whom I met in Los Angeles, who is this very scholarly man, you remember that? Oh, Jay, yes, Edwin Orr. And uh, I remember uh, when we had lunch with him that day in Los Angeles, uh, I think he's now with Jesus, but when we had lunch with him, he was a very intelligent, very scholarly man, Sheila, from Belfast, who went to Cambridge University, had two or three Cambridge degrees, and then traveled all around the world in the 20s and the 30s, believe it or not, as, a, as an evangelist, r having very, very large meetings in America and Britain and in Africa and in Europe. So really a very powerful man. But I remember um, him saying, so much of today's Christianity is like the song, is there anyone around could lift me off the ground? <laughs> and I think that that describes a lot of what we call Christianity. It's very egocentric. It's utterly preoccupied with, was it a good meeting? Not did it bring glory to God, but was it a good meeting in that it brought satisfaction and pleasure to me? And was this a good prayer to meeting? Usually means, was I inspired by it? Were there lots of emotional prayers that lifted me up? And so often we're thinking in terms of what the Lord can do for me. Or I'm not going to that church anymore because the teaching isn't as good as I want. Or I'm not going to this church anymore because it doesn't do anything for me. And so we're utterly preoccupied with ourselves. It's really atheism but we give it the name of Christianity. Well, of course, Ephesians is a complete corrective to that. It talks about reality from the point of view of heaven, the heavenly places. It's full of language that defies the use even of ordinary adjectives. And so you find that Paul piles adjective on adjective on adjective because he's really beginning to hit those things that no one can describe in ordinary human words. Uh, it has another great corrective to our attitude here because he makes no excuse for saying there's a mystery. There is a deep mystery in God. There is a mystery that we will never completely understand. And we, of course, silly little people, we have said, oh, there must be no mystery. We must understand it fully, otherwise we can't accept it. So we understand little of it, because we'll only accept what little we understand, and we will not go on trust at all. So we miss all the glory and the beauty and the wonder of what God has for us, because we're always analyzing the thing, taking it apart, finding out how you do this, Think of how often, how do you pray? How do you pray? How do you get filled with the Spirit? How do you speak in tongues? How do you witness? We're always talking about how to, how to, how to, so that somehow we think we can do it. Well, of course, Paul says there is a great mystery here, and there is a mystery, some of which you will never plumb, and you will need to trust your Father. And of course, often we end up in our methodological uh, atheism because we will not accept there is a mystery and we won't trust our Father. And so we'll only trust ourselves and our pea brains because that's about the size they are compared with his. So that's why we often see our Christianity is so human or so humanistic. It's really deteriorated into a kind of atheistic salvation, much like Buddhism. Ephesians, of course, changes all that because he says it's God. It's God that matters. God is the center of everything. God is the controller of everything. We always want to control. And that's why we end up, that's why many of us end up with tranquilizers and many end up in psych wards because we try to control our own lives the way we want. And we want to control everything, every little thing. And so we grow tighter and tighter, and we actually shrink more and more and more. 
until actually we don't have a very large sphere of reality at all. It's a very small sphere. We live in a very tiny world. And inside that tiny world, as Chesterton said, he said, the insane are very logical, and they're very logical inside their own insanity. It's just they don't reach out to reality. And so we're very logical in that. And that's why people shrink and grow smaller and smaller. That's actually why the, the lady, Sheila, was saying some guy, I think I didn't catch it completely, but I think somebody killed an old age pensioner by pushing a trolley, a, a grocery trolley, into the, yesterday. And that's why we do this kind of, that's why we have road rage, because we have this tiny little world that gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and we alone matter. Nobody else matters. It's utter unreality. And so God, of course, is allowing dreadful things like that to happen to give us warning. You're shrinking into a hell of unreality. And of course, Ephesians takes it out into reality. And Paul says, God, God is the one who controls everything. Why did Jesus wait for 2,000 years to come after the, the, after the, the century began. Well, because God, God times everything. God times things. God determines things. But you know, we have learned even to rebel against that. We want, ah, oh, but why did he? Why did he? And so dum-dums like me then try to explain why he did. But finally, it's right what God has said in Ephesians. God is God. He owns the thing. He owns the whole thing. He's made it all. It's his. He can do what he wants. He can turn the thing upside down if he wants. So, of course, we have turned it upside down by putting our mighty selves, all the little dwarfs, stand on the communion table. You know, that's what it's like. Lots of little pygmies, you know, saying, me, me, me. And underneath is the Christ who has bled, who is the one who has made the table, has made the dwarfs, has made everything. So it's utter unreality, the egocentricity of our Christianity today. And Ephesians, of course, says, no, God is the one who has control over time. He has predestined you to be his sons through Jesus Christ from before the foundation of the world. It's that great realm of eternity that Paul begins to deal with in Ephesians. So it is a mighty gospel, you know. Now, those are some of the characteristics of it, but let's begin right at the first verse. You see it there, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are also faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, an apostle of Jesus Christ is that word. It's, uh, it's uh, that in Greek, and uh, it's uh, that in English. You can see it. Apostolos. And Paul, first of all, calls himself an apostolos, an apostle. Uh, what is an apostle? Well, you can look at it there as he describes it in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 9 and 1. Uh, page 996 it is. Uh, am I not free? Uh, am I not an apostle? And then he gives the first uh, characteristic of an apostle. Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? And uh, you know the way in charismatic circles, uh, oh, I remember one dear fellow came to me from Nelson Publisher. Yeah, I should have taken him up. He wanted me to write a book, you know, in the old days of Minneapolis. And he said, you're involved in a real apostolic work, you know. So you know in the charismatic movement the way we say, oh, that's an apostolic work. Well, we're not talking about that kind of apostle. They mean by that, uh, that's a very remarkable work, <laughs> or that's a work they dared say, you know, on the same level as the apostles, which is ridiculous. So 
It's not that use of the word apostle. It's apostle in the sense, I saw Jesus. I saw Jesus. Uh, the disciples saw Jesus alive physically. I also saw him. Uh, I saw him on the road when he struck me blind. I saw Jesus. So an apostle is, first of all, one who, a historical apostle, is one who has personally seen Jesus. So that's why they talked about the apostles. And that's why we talk about the Apostles' Creed. It's tied to those days when Jesus himself was seen physically by men. So, first of all, am I not an apostle? Have I seen, not seen Jesus our Lord? Are not you my workmanship in the Lord? And the second characteristic of an apostle is that there are people who have received Jesus and been changed in their lives under his ministry. And that's why he says, If to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. So an apostle is one who has seen Jesus alive and who has also seen God work in others' lives through his ministry. But there's something else about an apostle. That comes from a Greek verb that looks like that, apostello. And it means to send. An apostle is one who has experienced Mark 6 and 7 there. Mark chapter 6 and verse 7. And he called, it's page 872, 872. <coughs> and he called to him the twelve, and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he called to him the twelve, and began to send them out two by two. It's someone that Jesus has sent. It's not someone who has seen a need. It's not that. It's not someone who has seen a need, has seen uh, the poor children in a certain city and felt somebody should try to help those. It's not somebody who sees that place needs a church. Uh, I think I ought to go and find a church there. It's someone who is sent by Jesus. It's not someone who says, well, I have this talent. And then it really is like this. You know, I know we don't say it like this, but it is like this. How shall I use it for the Lord? You know, I mean, we're, we're so pathetic, you know. But it's not that. The apostles had none of that, you know. They didn't get together and say, now, Peter, you're good at this. Now, Paul, you're good at this. Now, you'd be good at this. The Lord must mean you to do that. They didn't. They didn't even think of talents. They knew talents were of no value in doing God's work. So there was no thought of that. There was only one thing that made them an apostle, and that was they were sent by Jesus. Nor was it that they thought, well, I think that ministry would fulfill me. I think, I think I'd feel fulfilled if I were doing that. As I imagine myself day by day counseling, I think that I would feel fulfilled. I think it would, it would make me feel I was doing something worthwhile. It would give me a sense of satisfaction. I could go home at night and feel that that was a good day's work. What would you do as you wipe the blood off from the stones? What would you do as you pulled the sword out of your side? Would you feel, I fulfilled the day. I feel I fulfilled my ministry. In other words, the apostles didn't think that way at all. They knew they had one thing ahead of them, and that was probably not simply discomfort, but probably suffering and death. And the only reason they were apostles was they were sent by Jesus not because they felt they would be fulfilled, not because they thought this would be a nice life. So, you know, it doesn't take me to 
painted too vividly for you to see. Of course, we're way off beam. We're completely off beam. We're completely self-centered. Well, I think I'm a good speaker, so I think I could preach. Well, I think I'm good with young people, so I should work with young people. Well, I think I'm a good musician, so I think I should be in the music ministry. Well, I would like to go there. Well, that place has a need for the kind of person I am. None of that. An apostle is one who is sent by Jesus. That's it. One who is sent by Jesus. That's why Paul says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Of Jesus Christ means belonging to Jesus Christ. It means somebody who is owned by Jesus Christ completely. It's not just somebody who is sent by Jesus Christ, but someone who is actually owned by Jesus Christ. Someone who, it, for him to live, is Christ. He thinks of nothing else but Christ. Does he think about whether he can do some good in this church? No, he doesn't. Does he think whether he can fulfill himself in this ministry? No, he doesn't. Does he think whether he can fulfill a need there in that country? No, he doesn't. He sees only one thing, Jesus Christ. You're right, his world is small, but it's bigger than the universe because Jesus Christ is the one who originated it. So to just have your eyes full of Jesus Christ is to be full of reality in a way that is far beyond even an awareness of the world around us or the universe around us. So, an apostle of Jesus Christ is someone who belongs to Jesus Christ, who is owned by Jesus Christ, who is preoccupied with Jesus Christ, who is obsessed with Jesus Christ, who pleases no one else but Jesus Christ, who wants only to be close to one person above all others, and that's Jesus Christ. So he's Jesus, 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 until you think the guy's crazy with Jesus. That's what an apostle of Jesus Christ is. And that's how you can ever know if Jesus sent him. Because I think all of us get into trouble. We think, well, how do you know you're sent? Well, if you're that close, if you're utterly preoccupied, if Christ fills you completely, of course you know the blink of his eye. Of course you know the beat of his heart. You feel like him. You sympathize with him. You want what he wants. So, of course, he's able in a moment to gently transmit to you what he wants you to do. So that, is there any doubt? There is no doubt. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. It's not, oh, I'd like to do a little preaching. It's, I'll die if I don't preach. That's it. I'll die if I don't do what God has called me to do. So an apostle of Jesus Christ is one who utterly belongs to Jesus Christ. Now, I think there's an important verse in connection with that, <clears throat> that we ought to just look at for a moment in Romans 8 and verse 9. Because I think that <clears throat> it may help us ourselves and it may help us in our dealings with others. Romans 8 and 9. But you are not in the flesh, you are in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. An apostle of Jesus Christ, one who belongs to Jesus, has the Spirit of Jesus. I think that's a fair way to just look at ourselves from time to time, and certainly a fair way to ask of others, you know. Have we the Spirit of Christ? Have we the Spirit of Christ? Are we meek? He said, I am meek and lowly of heart. Are we meek and lowly of heart? Or are we proud? He was humble. He kneeled down and washed the disciples' feet. Are we humble? Or are we arrogant, self-assured, and self-righteous? Are we merciful? And have we tender mercies? Have we a gentle and soft kindliness to others? Have we a hunger to be with God? Do we enjoy prayer? Do we enjoy being with him, with our Father in heaven? Have we the Spirit of Christ? 
There are two kinds of people who fall. I think one falls, sins, does something wrong. And, well, they're annoyed with themselves and, well, they think they're partly wrong and they're going to try again next time to do better. And then I think there's another who has the Spirit of Christ. And they fall and their hearts are filled with tears. And they are, are disgusted with themselves. And they know they're wrong. And you only have to say something that is in accordance with Jesus' will. And they say, oh, yes, that's what I want. So they have the Spirit of Christ. So anybody who belongs to Christ has the Spirit of Christ. And if a person hasn't the Spirit of Christ, they may believe in Christ, they may try to serve Christ, but they don't belong to Christ. Because if you belong to Christ, Christ fills your whole being. And he is the fountain and the source of all your feelings and all your attitudes. So that's an apostle is one who belongs to Jesus Christ and has the very Spirit of Christ. And then you can see that what Paul does is he really reinforces that. In Galatians 1 and 15, you can see it. Galatians 1 and 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and had called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. 15. But when he who had set me apart before I was born. That, that's what he has just said, you know, in Ephesians an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. When he who had set me apart before I was born. Not I've had such and such an education, not I've had such and such an upbringing, not because I have these talents. That's all such silly, foolish, temporal stuff when he who had set me apart before I was born called me. In other words, God knew each one of us before we were born, and he foresaw our lives, and he planned what we should do. And the only thing we need is not talents, is not ability, is not to know what our interests are, or what our major is at university, or how we come across to people, or what we like to do, or what we would feel, feel, feel fulfilled doing. The only issue is, what did God set me apart for before I was born? That's it. Because we're the same. We're in the same situation. God knew why he sent each of us to earth, and he set us apart for that before we were born, all we need to do is find out what that is. And then that's what we do. Because it's God's will alone that matters. It's not what we're like or what abilities we have or what talents we have. It's what God's will is for our lives. That's the only thing that matters. And so actually today, you can see it's not what would I like to do this afternoon? What would give me pleasure? How could I help somebody even? It's Lord, you saw this day. What did you have in mind for me this day? Rather, Lord, what did you have in mind for your son Jesus using this body that I used to regard as mine? That's it. And that's reality. That's God-centered. That's God-centered. I've only got half a first time today. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we bow before you. 
Oh, Father, we want to see the world the right way up. Not this upside-down world that we have been brought up in, where we have put ourselves in front of everything else, in front even of you. Lord, we want to come into reality. We also want to be able to say our name, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. We ask you to bring us into this reality. Holy Spirit. the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and evermore. Amen.